In this episode, I am joined by Joe Evans, founder of the Rangdro Foundation and teacher of Dzogchen under the name Jigme Rangdro. Joe discusses his impoverished upbringing, recounts unusual childhood resonances with aspects of Tibetan Buddhism, and reveals how his boyish fantasies about meeting a guru were shattered when he met Gelek Rinpoche in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Joe shares his own practice journey, including his dream yoga skills and understanding of the great perfection, and recalls a transformative Vajrayogini retreat in which powerful meditation and dream experiences saw him seek the guidance of famous Dzogchen master Namkai Norbu. Joe also shares his love of books, gives a tour of his library, highlights volumes of particular significance, and discusses the role of study in the path of Dzogchen. So without further ado, Joe Evans. Joe Evans, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, I'm so delighted to talk with you. You've had quite a remarkable life thus far, and so fascinating, and I'm very excited to discuss it all with you. We were just discussing before we began recording that you're in a yurt, we're now officially in competition for the coolest uh, place to be. I'm in a boat. You're in a yurt. I think it's a tie now. <laughs> it's so beautiful Maybe. that yurt. Yeah, your your boat seems pretty nice, you know. And then again, I've been living in this quite small yurt for about five years now. So perspective, it's relative. Your boat's looking very nice from the perspective of this 20-foot yurt. Well, you know, it's very funny you should say that. I think your 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 yurt looks absolutely beautiful. And I, I see your books up there. I think I recognize some of those spines. That's very, very cool. Are you a, a book lover? I am a book lover. I've always kind of had an affinity for books and had to shed them from time to time as I've moved into small spaces and things like that. But some of these here are core aspects of my collection and also guides in a certain way, representations of the Buddha's speech, as Buddha said, as he was passing away, in the future, I'll appear in the world as words and syllables. So as practitioners in my tradition and my lineage, we rely a great deal on our core texts and the syllables and meanings that have been represented by lineage masters and the Buddha over the years. So not only do I enjoy books, in physical form, but they also really have this sacred place in my own path. I wonder if you might show us a couple of the books back there that are particularly meaningful to you. I think I see some So Rigpa books up there. Is that the Gyushi you've got? Yeah, yeah so I do have the, the Gyushi up here. These are the Gyushi. These are the four tantras, the medical tantras, and they're actually so Rigpa, Tibetan medicine, Ayurveda, and things like this are actually they're really significant for Dzogchen practitioners. Um, in the Dzogchen Tantras, we have a very similar description of the way that the body is formed, the way that different energies and capacities govern the functioning of your experience. And from the perspective of the Dzogchen teachings, every aspect of our experience is an opportunity to wake up to the actual nature of all of our dimension, all of our experience. So if we have that kind of knowledge, it's really useful for us as Dzogchen practitioners. And then I've got some of these translations of Dzogchen Tantras, which in my opinion, we're extremely fortunate at this particular time being English speakers in the world because Wisdom Publications and Acharya Malcolm Smith are producing these beautiful translations of the 17 Tantras of the Upadesha class of Dzogchen teachings. And they're beautifully packaged. They're translated by someone with extraordinary knowledge and experience of the teachings. So I have the first four volumes of these here, and they're also translated with the extant commentaries that we have from Vimala Mitra. So it's a tremendous resource, and I refer to these very frequently. And then I've also got the the works of Long Chempa, several that are in English and Tibetan. So we've got, you can't really see them above me, but my guru, Kenshin Namdral Rinpoche, he has taught the Sikhton Zud, this precious treasury of the genuine meaning, as it's translated by Sangha Khandro and Lama Chonam. But he also has, you know, 
commentaries about this thick that are really extraordinary. And also Kenshin Namdral's commentary on the Yeshe Lama, which plays a really significant role in my experience as a practitioner. I received those teachings and transmissions for the first time from another one of my root teachers, Dungse Riggs and Dorjan Rinpoche, many years ago. And that informed my path tremendously. And then I've got these pages of some Tibetan texts here. This uh, one at the bottom here is this is the collection of writings on the Chetsun Ningtik, which is a very important cycle of teachings from Jamian Kyansai Wangpo that's connected with the Vima Ningtik and Chetsun Sangye Wangchuk, who's another one of our lineage masters. And then the Chuyangzud of Longchampa. And then the Lungi Terzo, the commentary on the Chuyangzud by Longchampa here. So many of these are things that I refer to, if not on a daily basis, then quite often, especially when I'm interacting with students and examining my own understanding of the teachings. I wonder if you might take down a particularly beautiful one and show it. Is there, I understand some of them are printed very nicely. Yeah, so these translations of the Tantras that Wisdom Publications is putting out are, I think, lovely. They're very simple. They come in these nice slip cases with this syllable A, ah, which is really the most important symbol for Dzogchen practitioners and encompasses the entire meaning of Dzogchen teachings. And then the actual volumes themselves have some really lovely calligraphy in them from Tashi Mannix, who you may be familiar with as well. He's a brilliant calligrapher. And then also the the Light of Baratsana editions of their books are also quite beautiful. They do these lovely slip covers, these dust jackets, mm -hmm. nice art of Jigme Lingfan, the Yeshe Lama commentary. And then the editions themselves are also quite beautiful underneath. Yeah. So not only do they contain a great deal of inspiration, but they also... They look nice. It's nice to be surrounded by books. You know, um, sometimes Dzogchen, uh, I think, is thought of as a, a path where, very simple path with, you can dispense a lot of the intellectual learning and dispense with all, a lot of that sort of thing. And you can go sort of straight to the heart of it. You can have perhaps a guru point out to you through conversation the nature of mind, and you're introduced to that directly shortcut in a way maybe and uh and you can work with that you don't need all the other paraphernalia and so on that's i think a an understanding of talk chen uh that's sometimes uh, held uh, but here you've talked us through several of your beautiful books and you have a great passion for that and you do have a, a passion for study in general and for learning and uh that's that's something that i think characterizes you yet you were a talk chenpa so i wonder if you might talk a little bit about how you see this role of studying and learning and that sort of thing in in Dzogchen practice in particular, the way you see it. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that, that, that that's incorrect or that it's a misperception. Um, it is an aspect of the teachings. We have this kind of, this understanding of the teachings where traditionally you would talk about it as being like, an illiterate shepherd can discover the meaning of Dzogchen, or a great pandit can discover the meaning of Dzogchen. My understanding of this is that the reason why anyone can understand the meaning and discover the meaning of Dzogchen is because the meaning of Dzogchen is the nature of all sentient beings. It's your own nature. Everyone has the same nature. It's just a matter of discovering that nature. And of course, there are essentially infinite means of doing so. Long Champa in the commentary on his Chuying Zhu outlines seven traditional ways of doing this. And some of them are through ritual empowerments. Some of them are through means of just explaining the meaning to a disciple. Other ways are even direct introduction through confusion. You sort of create a circumstance where you kind of 
create an environment of confusion and then use that interruption of conceptual proliferation to introduce a student to their own natural instant presence in that way. So there's a great deal of diversity in how people can actually come to understand the meaning of Dzogchen teachings. So this eliminates some of those limitations of one being correct and the other being incorrect. So for example, saying, oh, Dzogchen is just about resting in non-conceptual awareness, man. You don't need to know anything. Like that's one extreme point of view, right? And then the other extreme is that you have to spend your entire life reading a bunch of books and things like this. One end of that might work for one individual and the other might not. So we have to work within that spectrum of diversity in order for people to actually understand the meaning and integrate that meaning into their own experience, into their own lives. So it's not as though one's right and one's wrong. It's that we have a spectrum. And especially if someone's going to be explaining something, it's my opinion, because this is the opinion of my teachers, that you have to do some rigorous study. And my other very important teacher, Chogyal Namkai Norbu, he insisted that anyone who's going to be teaching anything or explaining anything has to continuously be examining their own understanding. If they're going to be explaining something to students, they have to really authentically examine their understanding and then present that information as accurately as possible so that people can actually practice the path in a qualified way. And this is also asserted by Long Champa that if you're going to actually teach something, you have to understand the diversity of the yanas, and this comes through study, contemplation, and actual practice. Whereas if you're a practitioner and you're never going to be explaining something to anyone, you can merely study what you're practicing. So there's a bit of a distinction here. So some people might directly enter into the teachings of the great perfection, understand in a very simple way, and others, maybe they're inclined towards studying and reading a lot of books, or maybe they really need that support as signposts on their path. Very interesting indeed. And uh, I understand also that the study of the Tibetan language has been an essential part of your, your own learning journey. I wonder if you might talk a, a bit about that. Yeah. Um, I find it fascinating, this kind of, of the study of the language and the ability to actually understand a little bit of context, I think makes a big difference when, especially if you're going to be explaining something. And there are a few terms in Dzogchen teachings that are quite difficult to translate and have been translated in certain ways for many years that require, in my opinion, a little bit more explanation because they're incredibly important terms. And when they get translated, into a language that doesn't really have an equivalent term for them without a great deal of explanation, they can kind of end up being a little bit confusing. Some examples of this are yeshe or ngana, yeshe in Tibetan, ngana in Sanskrit, and oftentimes we see this being translated as like wisdom or primordial wisdom or something like that. And again, it's not as though these translations are wrong. It's that there's a little bit more nu nuance to the term itself. So we have in Tibetan, we have this ye. Ye means original from the beginning, often translated as primordial. And she is consciousness. So yeshe is a modality of consciousness that is pristine, original from the beginning, unborn, unchanging, etc. Whereas we have prugna, or Sherab in Tibetan. And this actually connotes incisive knowledge, like truly knowing something. And in my opinion, this is more closely, this more closely resembles the English word wisdom, sort of like real knowledge of a subject. Whereas this isn't really what Yeshe or Ngana is, at least in the context of Dzogchen teachings. In Dzogchen teachings, Yeshe is the basis the basis of the individual, your true nature, that from which all of the appearances, experiences of samsara and nirvana arise. It's pristine, it's original, it's uncompounded, and so on. A bit different from wisdom. 
And another one of my favorites is datu or ying in Tibetan. And this particular word is a very interesting word in Sanskrit. And sometimes it gets translated as space or basic space or something like this. But this term datu is really fascinating. It can be a synonym for emptiness, but it can also mean an enclosure. So for example, if we're talking about the datu of Rigpa, this can actually refer to the space within the body of a sentient being where the basis abides while you're alive. And in the teachings that correspond with, as we were mentioning before, sort of the medical tantras and the Dzogchen tantras, this is actually the center of the individual, the core. This is where pristine consciousness, the basis, abides within the body of a sentient being while they're alive. It can also mean the empty space. It can be a reference sort of shorthand for the Dharma Datu, the empty nature of all phenomena, and things like this. It can mean the space in which appearances arise. So it's a very interesting term. And the nuances and context have to be explained thoroughly in order for people to really understand what's being expressed by the Dzogchen teachings. This is one of the difficulties, I think, that translators of Dzogchen texts face, is that these terms are very precise, they're very nuanced, and they can also mean different things in different contexts. Very interesting. I'd like to return a little later to some of the themes you're bringing up, some of these nuanced terms, and also other questions about Dzogchen and how we might situate it in the wider Buddhist ecosystem, I suppose we could put it that way. But perhaps we could return now to your life. I'm curious about the context of your upbringing. What was, what was that like? And I understand your interest in these things was sparked a martial arts class when you're a boy and reading mm -hmm. uh, certain sorts of books. But um, so I'm curious more broadly, what was your upbringing like? And how was it that you stumbled upon an interest in these sorts of themes? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up in a small town in Michigan, in central Michigan, which is, you know, in the Midwest here in the United States. And there was nothing there. So I didn't have some sort of environment that I was kind of, you know, marinating in that would guide me toward interest in the teachings of the Buddha or any spiritual path, really. And we were, we were pretty poor when I was a small kid, when I was growing up. And then my parents split up when I was quite young. I was about six years old. And my mother and I, we just moved across town into an apartment. And it was her and I for a while. And she was actually working as a dog groomer and putting herself through university at the time. So she was very busy. So I was walking to school, walking home, and kind of I had a lot of responsibility and independence for being as young as I was because my mother was so busy and making an effort to care for me. So she needed to find things for me to do, places where I could go. And this is kind of where the martial arts class came into being, is that this was something that I could do. So I went to this class, and as you mentioned, this is kind of what sparked my interest because we would meditate really briefly before we actually did any kind of training. And I found that I really enjoyed this, and it was something that I felt naturally drawn to. So I had no idea what I was doing, of course, but I continued to do this throughout middle school, high school, everything like that. And when I was younger, I had a couple of experiences that I think were maybe related to an inclination to the teachings. I have vague memories of hearing or overhearing something on the television about His Holiness the Dalai Lama and being very interested in that and that kind of clicking with me in a certain way. And then I have another memory when I was about 10 years old, I had this was living in this, we had this really nice finished basement space. And I was down there and I was kind of imagining and I was doing prostrations kind of in a, in a pretty good way, actually. They weren't bad. And, you know, I'm not saying that this is like some memory of a past life or anything like that, but I didn't, I, I can't recall ever experiencing them or seeing them, but I do have this memory of kind of 
doing prostrations and feeling like it was a spiritual pack a practice of this kind. I don't know what that means. I don't think I have any kind of particular capacity for remembering anything, but it was an experience that I had that was interesting when I look back on it now, that maybe there is some kind of connection to this path for me. And then in high school, my mother actually got me a copy of My Land and My People, this autobiography of the Dalai Lama, and I read it, and I was very interested, and that kind of sparked everything else. Then I started reading a lot of different books and eventually ended up going to the University of Michigan because they had a Tibetan language program, and they had really good Buddhist studies professors there that I could learn from, and... It was kind of, that was the the on-ramp for everything, so to speak, for me. Then I ended up moving to Boston, where I got to work for Wisdom Publications, and that was really a formative and remarkable experience for me, both personally, spiritually, and professionally, was getting to work with all of those folks. And through them, I got to meet so many teachers and really had a wonderful experience and made great friends that I still have to this day. Very interesting. In your teenage years, what sort of books were you reading when you, uh, after you finished the Dalai Lama's autobiography, what sort of things were you reading? And were you also experimenting with practice at that time? Did you try practices out that you find in the books? What, what was that period like? Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was reading books and things like this during this time. I was reading, you know, like you start reading books by Chogyam Trungpa and things like this, I think, around that time in one's development. So I was reading a lot of books like that. And I was, I would say I was trying to practice a little bit, but the majority of my practice was fantasy, of course, at that time. First of all, because I had never met a teacher in real life, so I didn't have any real understanding of what that relationship meant or how much more dynamic the experience of practice actually is when you're collaborating with a teacher. But I was meditating and I was trying to practice and I was engaging with my experience in that way as much as I could, but it was still, it didn't really, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense. I had these fantasies that I would have to go somewhere it was a big one. Like in my mind at that time, when I was reading these books and things like this, I was like, I'm going to have to go and live in India or Nepal or Tibet or something like this in order to find a teacher. And I was drawn toward the Tibetan tradition, but I was also reading, you know, books about Zen and things like that. So I didn't really have any clarity about what I was going to do. But this idea that I had to go somewhere and that I had to become like a monk or something. This was very prominent in my mind as a fantasy during really the first several years of my early experience of being a practitioner. And then when I finally did meet my first teacher, it, it shattered this fantasy a little bit because I was going to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and I was gonna go there because this fantasy was so strong but I was thinking, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to learn some Tibetan, and then I'm going to go to India, and then I'm actually going to be able to meet someone and receive some teachings. And when I was first going to Ann Arbor to go visit the university before I actually started classes, and I was getting my apartment and everything like that, I saw these Tibetan prayer flags, and I thought, oh, there must be some sort of shop with some books and things like this. And I went in, and sure enough, there was. But I also found out that that night there was a Tibetan teacher that was going to be giving a teaching on the Bodhicharya Avatara and that he lived there and he spoke English and he was a, by all appearances, a normal person. He wore, you know, Western suits and things like this. So a lot of my perceptions were shattered when I met my first real teacher. And who was that first teacher? Um, his name was Gelek Rinpoche. He was, uh, he was a Galukpa Lama. He passed away, unfortunately, in 2016. But he was an extraordinary teacher. He was an incredibly kind person. He was incredibly kind to me, this young kid who stumbled in and had this <laughs> had a, a pretty funny experience with meeting him, 
that again changed a lot of my perceptions you know i was very uptight i was really rigid when i got there i was like oh i have to be perfect in this experience so i was really nervous and anxious and i went into the gompa and i was early and you know i'm sitting very properly in like full lotus or something and i had to go to the bathroom you know i had to I had to pee and I was like starting to, I'm like looking at the time. I'm like, oh, I only have a couple minutes. I can't be late. So I go out and I'm waiting for the bathroom and I'm kind of frustrated because someone's in there and they're sort of taking time and I'm nervous. And this short man comes bursting out of the door and grabs my hand and like really vigorously shakes my hand. And he says, oh, hi, guy. And he's like whacking me on the shoulder and shaking my hand. And I'm kind of like, who's this strange person? So I rush in, go to the bathroom, and I rush back into the gompa. And sure enough, that was Gallic Rinpoche. And he's sitting in his seat about to teach. So this was very good for me to realize that this kind of tension was largely unnecessary, entirely unnecessary, really. And also just a diversion from actually experiencing the humanity of the teachings. Because the teachings are about human beings. They're about people. They're about living beings and how we can actually liberate ourselves from tensions, anxieties, and ultimately the endless continuity of discomfort of samsara. So rather than creating tension and discover, discomfort around my anxieties around the teachings, I learned this very important lesson from him on the first day that we met that, you know, you can relax a little bit and actually be present in that way rather than trying to be perfect or trying to be rigid in this kind of way. And how long did you stay with Galak Rinpoche? I studied with Rinpoche for... I think probably four or five years before I moved to Boston to work for Wisdom Publications. So I moved to Boston and started to receive some other teachings from other teachers in different lineages around that time. Like I'd received some teachings from Kempo Karta Rinpoche while I was living in Ann Arbor as well, because there was a little center there. So I'd kind of had a little bit of familiarity with some Kagyu teachings. And while I was working, I also worked for Gaelic Rinpoche at his little bookstore at his temple there. And they had a great selection of books. So I was exploring the other lineages of Tibetan Buddhism, in particular some Dzogchen teachings and things like that. But I hadn't yet received teachings in a qualified way. So I studied with him quite a bit. I did some preliminary practices, retreats, and things like that under his guidance. And then once I moved to Boston, then things really kind of opened up for me quite a bit. Before we go to Boston, I'm, I'm curious a bit about your University of Michigan time there. I believe some of your professors, Donald Lopez, Luis Gomez, these are well-known figures yeah. in the field. Uh, what education did you do there, and how far did you take it? Yeah, so I primarily... There, I primarily studied Tibetan language, and Gareth Sparham was the Tibetan language teacher at the time. And I was taking just about any Buddhist studies-oriented course I could take, along with, you know, regular undergrad curriculum. But for me, really, Luis Gomez was the standout academic professor for me. Like, he was, he was extraordinary. He was a fascinating person. This is the kind of person who, for pleasure and enjoyment, would read Bhutanese fairy tales to his grandchildren and things like this. You know, he would have these courses that were, they were academically challenging, so they were typically kind of small. And we had this classroom, it was the same classroom where Gareth Sparham taught Tibetan language, but it was it's the building's not there anymore. It's called the Freeze Building. And it had this little kind of library room. So you're in this room with all these interesting books all around. And there'd be like six to 10 students and Dr. Gomez. And we would play, we played Sakya Pandita's game of liberation. 
in his class at one point, which was really fun and amazing. But he always asked great questions and he was really, he really made you think about what it is you were learning. But I also felt that he really taught us how to think about how we were learning. Like, how are we actually investigating topics? Are we looking at them from multiple perspectives or are we just kind of like trying to accumulate information so that we can pass a test or something like this? He really wanted his students to investigate their knowledge. And I strongly feel like this is how we really can relate to learning the teachings themselves. So for example, rather than just sort of reading through a liturgical text or a sadhana or something like that. When we're reading through a text like this, we examine, we actually go through the process of understanding the meaning of each aspect so that we can integrate that into our own experience rather than just going through some sort of spiritual routine, right? Like we have to go beyond the surface into the actual essence and meaning of anything if we're truly going to understand it. And this is something that I really felt that I was able to learn from Luis Gomez at that point in my experience. He was he was very cool. Fascinating indeed. And how does it work in the US? Is it, what do you call that, a degree in Buddhist studies or is it t Tibetology or what, what's it called, uh, the degree you have? Yeah, if you, you know, it depends. In undergraduate circumstances, which is how I was studying, it's... Asian languages and cultures would be the title of that degree. And then I also ended up going and getting a psychology degree later on in life from Northern Arizona University, which I think also informed my experience quite a bit. But yeah, you know, once you, once people go, if they're going to go into like graduate school and get a PhD and things like this, then you'd have fancier academic titles and degrees something more exciting, like being a Tibetologist, which I'm, I'm certainly not. Given your passion, passionate interest in study and in, in these things, did you consider taking that further into a master's or a PhD or something, you know, to get one of those, as you put it, fancy titles? Is that something that ever appealed to you? Um, I'm just curious. It did. It did when I was younger. Um, and I think, yeah, I think when I was studying at that point, I still kind of had that motivation a little bit. And I can't think of a specific moment or turning point where I decided that that wasn't going to be the path that I was going to pursue. I think my path probably just organically developed as... I didn't really feel much of a, I didn't really feel deeply connected to being in an academic environment, I think is more what it was. I was more interested in practice. I was more interested in studying with my teachers and things like that. Whereas I think had I chosen to go that route, I think I probably would have been satisfied and had an interesting career and things like that. But I also feel like I had, I think I had experiences in the world that I needed to have as well outside of that kind of environment. So whether or not it was by design or my intention, there were other places that my life was going. And those are the means by which I ended up where I am now. So who knows? Yes, I was interested, but didn't do it. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, thanks for talking about that. Um, you've said that when you went to Boston, where you were working with Wisdom Publications, that's where, uh, you said elsewhere, I mean, that's where your practice really started to blossom, actually, in terms of your religious practice. What were you doing at Wisdom? What was your role there? And, and uh, can you talk about this this blossoming of practice that happened at that period? Sure. Yeah, so I initially got hired at Wisdom to be an, a part of the marketing and publicity department. 
And shortly after I started, I ended up being the director of that department. And my roles and responsibilities there were essentially I was writing the back cover copy on all the books that were coming out or most of them and helping with cover design and general presentation of the titles. And that was that was across the spectrum of the books that were being published. So it wasn't like it was limited to the Tibetan tradition or anything like that. But at this point, I, within the office, had started to, people knew that I had this kind of background, that I'd been practicing and studying in a serious way for a while. So I would often review the Tibetan titles that were coming in, and especially things that were associated with the Nyingma tradition or any Dzogchen oriented titles, because Wisdom for many years was affiliated with the FBMT, which is a Galukpa organization. So they had this very, they had an excellent catalog of Galukpa titles in the Tibetan tradition. But at the point when I was working with them, the number of titles that they had from the other lineages was not quite as robust. So a lot of the folks that were working in editorial there were more familiar with Galukpa style presentations. So I would read the other titles and advise on them and really through wisdom i got to connect with more people in the buddhist community because i was communicating with all kinds of different people and establishing different relationships with authors so i was then able to find out more about different organizations different traditions and different teachers and then pursue receiving teachings from them based upon my interest. And at this time, I also did this Vajrayogini retreat, which was a, so Vajrayogini, there are many different forms of Vajrayogini, but the one that I did in particular was this Narokacho, which is a very important practice in the Sakya lineage, as well as in the Gal Galupa lineage. And that's where I first received the empowerments and the explanations for this particular practice. And I went and did this accumulation retreat and it was a three week retreat and it was four sessions a day that were quite long. It was quite strict to do this particular accumulation. And during this retreat, there was a break between sessions and there was this small library. It was really, it was a bookshelf with some Buddhist books on it. It was in this farmhouse in Vermont. And I pulled a book down off the shelf, and it was Chogyal Namkai Norbu's Dream Yoga book. And I read it in a couple of sittings during breaks on that retreat. And that was kind of when I made this decision. I I knew who Rinpoche was, and I tuned into some webcasts and things like that. But it was really at that point that I decided, as soon as I got out of that retreat, that I was going to seriously pursue receiving Dzogchen teachings and take that as my path. And that was a significant moment for me because then my path went from being something that was, as Long Champa describes as being like a bee collecting nectar from different flowers to actually thinking about starting to make honey. So as soon as I got out of this retreat, this is what I did. I then pursued Dzogchen teachings in an earnest and at the time, as serious a way as I could. And that was really the, a definitive moment in my experience of being a practitioner. I understand that, perhaps I'm wrong about this, that you had an experience on that retreat, some kind of special experience that that was also involved here and was transformative and inspired you to seek out Dzogchen teachings in particular. Is that right? And if so, what was that experience? Well, <clears throat> I think I had a lot of experiences on that retreat, sort of, we have what we call we refer to as Nyam, right? Nyam is this Tibetan word for experience. And in this context, it particularly refers to experiences that arise during practice. And 
during this retreat, I started to have many very interesting dreams. And then the connection of these kinds of dreams that I was having with Norbert Rinpoche and his book sort of clarified this direction of the path for me. So I was having all of these nyam experiences arising in my dreams. And then Norbert Rinpoche explaining how you can actually integrate that into your path and your experience of your practice became something that was very interesting to me and also relevant to the experience that I was having in the moment. And prior to that, most of my other teachers didn't really talk about these kinds of experiences of dreams very much. It was kind of, you know, more the idea of, oh, don't think too much about dreams. They, you know, they're just, you know, we don't really talk about that so much. It had kind of been my previous experience. And it was something that was so prevalent for me was this kind of experience of my consciousness while I was asleep that actually connecting with a teacher who is explaining how this can actually function for you as a part of your path in a serious way was very interesting for me. Rinpoche had a lot of interesting dreams like this where he was meeting different lineage masters and they were revealing teachings to him. So his long cell teachings are largely revealed through the experiences of his dreams. And anytime that these dreams are revealing teachings, there was some sort of interaction with someone, whether it be Garab Dorje or Goma Devi or Guru Rinpoche or Jigme Lingpa, Longchampa and so on, but sort of identifying him in those dreams as the guardian of those particular teachings. So there's always this kind of moment in those stories of this kind of encounter and this designation of, oh, this is a part of the long cell teachings. These are your teachings to share with your disciples and things like this. So yeah, this kind of connection with the lineage is prevalent in a lot of these stories. And you, these long cell volumes, they're very interesting. These books of long cell teachings, they, they always recount how Rinpoche revealed these teachings within them. And it often takes place over the course of many years. So it's not necessarily just one dream that he has, but a sequence of dreams that'll be connected with the same teaching. So for example, he'll fall asleep. He'll start the story. He'll say something along the lines of, in this year, I was visiting Los Angeles and staying with some friends and students. And on one night, I had the following dream. And he'll explain a little bit. And then he'll say, and then someone entered my room and I woke up, so I wasn't able to remember the rest. And then he'll say, again, in the next section, in this year, blah, 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 which may have been many years later, I had the following dream. And it extends the revelation a little bit until eventually he has the entire thing. And then you get to the root text, the root revelation. So it's not necessarily... I guess the point I'm trying to make is that they're not one-offs, these experiences. They're actually continuous. There's something that occurs over time as your clarity develops. And this is an aspect of actually practicing in this way and integrating your experience of sleep with your practice is that you're increasing your experience of clarity, which increases your capacity to actually have these kinds of experiences that can be informative and inspiring on your path as a practitioner. Did you always have these sorts of dreams? Was that a part of your life or practice before that point? Or did this Badger Yogini retreat represent, uh, was it a new thing that, that was showing up on this Badger Yogini retreat? Um, it was always, I've always been, uh, an active dreamer, I guess you could say. Like I've always had pretty clear dreams and been able to remember my dreams most of the time. Um, 
and I started, you know, once I started practicing and I was doing some early retreats and things like this in my experience, I was having dreams. But like I mentioned, there was never, I hadn't received any kind of teachings that explained their significance. Um, so I wasn't really in dialogue with anyone about them or really receiving information on how to integrate that into the path until I was on that retreat. And then I had some very interesting dreams that were clearly connected to being immersed in intensive practice. And then when I left the retreat and I started receiving Dzogchen teachings, in particular from Norbert Rinpoche, and he was, he was very clear about the importance of the practice of night for everybody. So that was kind of the first time that those things came together was that I kind of had this natural experience of having clarity in dreams with those actually being something that I could cultivate as a part of my practice in a serious way, as opposed to just being something that, you know, could lead to me having fantasies or delusions on the path or something like that. Has it gone on then to become quite an important core piece of your own personal practice and journey beyond this Badger of Guinea retreat? Yeah. Um, ever since then, I've tried to keep a journal of my dreams, especially the ones that are significant, mm -hmm. that seem to have some sort of connection with the teachings or my own experience of the path. And they've been inspiring for me now that I actually know how to place them. And we can learn a great deal about our experience of the teachings and the teachings themselves by trying to maintain the continuity of our presence through a 24 hour period of the day. So I've had many dreams over the years that have been inspiring for me. They've been interesting for me. They've been things that I didn't understand or didn't really have a, a concept of their meaning or significance until many years later when I recall them again. So for example, I had this, I had a dream many years ago when I was living in Boston where, and my dreams are usually my dreams that are interesting usually occur in this way, where I'll wake up in my dream and I'm in my bed in wherever I'm living. So everything seems very normal. So I wake up, I'm in this apartment that I was living in in Boston. And I had this spare bedroom down the hall with my, my shrine set up. And it's where I did most of my practice. And I sit up in my bed and in this dream, I say, oh, Norbert Rinpoche is in the shrine room. He's in the gompa of the apartment. So I walk down the hall and I go in and he's sitting where my altar was. And we have a conversation. And then he takes out this red box, sort of like a reliquary. It was like beautiful. It was almost like a solid ruby. It was bright red and luminous. And he says, this is for you. And he hands it to me. And I opened it. And as soon as I opened it, I woke up from the dream. And I was very disappointed because I didn't get to see what was inside the box. And then maybe 10 years later, I was thinking about this dream. And I was like, oh, the gift for me is that I woke up. What's for me is to wake up. That was the point of the dream. That was the teaching of the dream. The box, there's nothing in the box. Waking up is the gift. That's the jewel, right? So at least this is how I interpreted the dream. And this, I'm telling, I'm sharing this particular story because I think this is a part of that relevance is that when you're having dreams of clarity and you're actually integrating that into your path, they can become inspiring for you on the path so that you can actually become more devoted and diligent in your path.
So rather than falling into some sort of fantasy or thinking that, you know, like I'm a special person because I had this interesting dream, you can look at these dreams and say, oh, this is beautiful. This is inspiring. And then go practice diligently because now you're inspired to practice. And this is the real meaning of receiving the blessings of the teacher, the blessings of the guru, the blessings of the lineage masters, is that now you're really inspired to practice with diligence because you actually feel this connection as a part of your life. So this is a way that I feel that these experiences are important, at least for me, is because they inspire me to be more dedicated and more diligent and really just have greater and greater appreciation for the kindness of my own teachers. Very interesting. And from what I understand of Namkan Orbu's teachings, there are there's a whole suite of day time practices, as well as nighttime practices that one does. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if you might talk a bit about, about that in perhaps framed in terms of your own journey, learning and applying those things. Do you, are you actively doing those dream yoga techniques throughout the day or in the evening? How, how does it look for you? Yeah. Um, I think it's one of the significant aspects of Dzogchen teachings is that Dzogchen teachings aren't limited to a turn or a session. Turn is Tibetan for like a, a session of practice. And Dzogchen teachings aren't limited in this way. So, for example, another story about Norbert Rinpoche is he would tell this story about people would come up to him after a teaching. Every time Rinpoche taught, he was incredibly generous. He would sit at his seat and people would line up. Sometimes hundreds of people would line up to say something to him, to ask him a question, to say hello, whatever. And he would always sit there and he would greet everyone. He would answer your questions. He was very generous with his time. <laughs> and he would tell this story about people coming up and saying, oh, Rinpoche, I'm practicing for two hours a day. And he would say something along the lines of, oh, that's very good. What are you doing with the other 22? And this illustrates this point that we're not necessarily confining ourselves to sitting for a certain period of time and considering that to be our practice. When you're a Dzogchen practitioner, your entire life is your practice, 24 hours a day, continuously. So when we practice in this way, we're integrating day and night. So for example, you wake up in the morning and the first thing that you do is guru yoga. You remember. You recollect, drenpa, you're mindful and present. This word in Tibetan, drenpa, for mindfulness or presence, it also means to remember, to recall. So you recall your own state. Longchenpa says in the Lama Yangtik, he says, Rigpa is introduced to the student by the teacher and then the, te the student diligently remembers it through mindfulness. So your path is to be present and recall that which you've been introduced to continuously. And this recollection is what actually allows you to familiarize yourself with that state and remain in the state of your own rigpa continuously. So when we're practicing the path of Dzogchen teachings, we're not distinguishing, we're not limited to some state that's previous to a session, a session of practice, and then a post meditation practice. It's a continuous flow of being in your own state. And the way that you do this is by being present, by recalling. So you practice the primary method, which is guru yoga, throughout the day so that you can remain in the state of guru yoga, which is rigpa. And then you fall asleep in the evening with that presence. And we use methods for that presence of visualization and things like this. But as you become familiar 
with maintaining that continuity of your presence, you're no longer becoming completely distracted or losing the continuity of your presence. And this is actually how you can maintain some kind of clarity when you're sleeping. And when you maintain this kind of clarity, you have various experiences. First, you have the experience of maybe you start to remember your dreams a little bit more than you did before. And then you start to maybe have these dreams of clarity where you're actually able to practice in your sleep or you're having some sort of experience where you're interacting with your teachers or you're having an experience where you see your Yidam deity and you chant some mantras or something like this. But really the essence of being able to have that kind of experience is maintaining your presence as much as you can while you're awake. I might have to petition you for a sequel, Joe, because this is so interesting. And we've really barely begun in terms of your own biography. And in terms of your own teachers, I'd love to know more mm -hmm. about your time with Namka Norber and Pache and uh, as well as um, Acharya Malcolm Smith and several of your other teachers. Yeah, I would enjoy a sequel. Good. Okay. Well, I know that this is the sort of thing that you've just discussed here. You teach at the Rangdral Foundation, which you founded. I wonder if you might say a little bit about that. Uh, we're skipping an awful lot. And so we'll just have to reserve that for the sequel. How come it is that you're teaching at all? How did that happen? You're very enthusiastically backed by your teachers. And how did that happen? Uh, of course, we'll discuss that next time. And it's a fascinating story. But that, that aside, what is the Rangdral Foundation? What inspired you to, to start it? And what happens there? Yeah, so the Rangdral Foundation happened pretty organically for me. I had been living where I live now in Washington on the Olympic Peninsula. And it's a pretty small community in general here. But there is a very nice town that's about 20 minutes away from where I live. And there wasn't much going on in terms of Dharma there. And I was shy about teaching anything. I didn't really feel like it's appropriate for me to do so. But people were interested in some meditation. So I was teaching just kind of like a general sort of meditation group that I was guiding. And some folks were coming and they were enjoying it. And I got to the point where I was not so interested in just sort of like guiding meditations. And I decided that I wasn't going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And then after a month or two of not doing it any longer, I got a phone call from a local woman and she invited me out to get some tea. And we went and we had tea and she requested Dharma teachings from me. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. We should say for the audio uh, people here that your uh, very beautiful dog is also requesting Dharma teachings from you, or maybe requesting dinner. <laughs> he's, he's requesting attention mostly. <laughs> um, but so she she asked if I would do this, and I said yes, and then we started very simply i would teach to a group of like three or four people in her apartment and the first thing i taught was the words of my perfect teacher and then more people started to come so we needed to rent a larger space and then i taught the bodhicharya avatara and then after that i taught the semning also by long champa and then eventually it started to get to the point where it felt like if it was sustainable, I had to let other people know what was going on. So that's when I founded the Wrong Girl Foundation, established a website and things like this. And through those first several years of giving any kinds of teachings, I was, I was quite shy about doing so. So I was always asking my teachers, in particular, doing same Rinpoche, saying, oh, is this okay? Um, how should I do this? And he's always been incredibly supportive and very helpful and given me excellent advice and guidance at every step of the way. So he's been incredibly important in helping me actually establish the confidence that I needed in order to establish confidence in students 
And really, that I think is one of the most important things that we face, especially in the transmission of Dzogchen teachings and Vajrayana Dharma in the West, is teachers and students having mutual confidence in each other. So if a teacher is confident in the teachings and has knowledge of the teachings and conveys them in a way that helps students establish confidence in their own path, in my opinion, this is really how we establish a long lasting authentic transmission of the teachings. So receiving that kind of inspiration and guidance from my own teachers has been crucial in this entire process. And the Wrong Girl Foundation has since developed. We do several different things every week because I also feel like it's incredibly important that teachers and students are continuously collaborating. So we practice together every Monday. We do a group question and answer sessions every Tuesday. And I teach some sort of traditional teaching every Thursday. We're about to finish the words of my perfect teacher again. And then starting on November 2nd, I'm going to teach the something also, the second volume in Long Chempa's Trilogy of Ease. And we do seasonal retreats. So we do four sort of weekend retreats. And those retreats really focus on Dzogchen teachings because that's an environment where everybody can receive transmission and empowerment in an appropriate way. And then I can explain the details of the Upadesha instructions so that they actually understand how to path, how to practice the path in a qualified way. And the next one is going to be winter. So we just finished our fall retreat, which was on the Upadesha instructions for liberation of the bardos. And then this winter, I'm going to teach a uh, trauma nakmo retreat, which is particularly connected with the instructions of Dzogchen teachings, this particular Troma Nakmo cycle. Amazing. Is this uh, all in person or also online? Is there an online component to it? Yeah, everything's primarily online at this point. It's the easiest way, I think, for people to connect with the teachings in a way that allows them to have some kind of regularity, some regular contact. So we also have a forum, a Discord group that people interact in quite regularly. And the opportunity for people to join online, I think, makes a big difference because you're not really limited by space. You're only limited by time. And this actually gives people an opportunity to interact regularly with me, with each other, and to receive teachings in a qualified way. And that collaboration is incredibly important, like being able to actually have a conversation with a teacher, ask questions, have someone who responds to your emails and things like that. Like that's been something that I've been fortunate to receive from my teachers over the years. So it's something that I'm also deeply committed to and providing for anyone who interacts with the Rangdrol Sangha. Rangdrolfoundation.org. Yeah, amazing. Well, Joe, this has been so fascinating, and I look forward to the sequel. We pick up where we, we left off. You've just encountered Amkai Norba Rinpoche, and, and there are many adventures to come. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.